welcome you today to today's webinar, Trade and Investment Opportunities in Pakistan, in partnership with the Federation of Pakistan Chambers of Commerce uh, and Industry. I'm greatly, um, very grateful for today's webinar and all the support from uh, the Federation and the, all the uh, speakers and panelists that we have today. Uh, it's all full, uh, it's a full agenda. Uh, charged with giving you great insights into Pakistan, one of the highest growth, um, growth markets uh, in Asia. So I'm going to start by um, uh, as, uh, telling you as well that the slides will be shared uh, after the event. Uh, the recording will also be made available through our YouTube channel. And uh, if you do have questions throughout the presentations, please do um, use the chat box and we'll pick them up at the panel uh, session. So first I wanted, uh, next slide please, I wanted to share uh, some uh, message from Andy Burnham, a mayor of Manchester. Next slide please. Can we play the video please? Hello, good afternoon everyone. I'm Andy Burnham, the Mayor of Greater Manchester, and I'm sorry that I can't be with you today, but I want to thank the Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce and the Federation of Pakistan Chambers of Commerce and Industry for allowing me to share this message with you. I was delighted to learn about the Memorandum of Understanding signed back in March and would like to commend both organisations for coming together to promote business and economic collaboration between our two countries. Greater Manchester and Pakistan are bound together by a shared history. We have a large and vibrant Pakistani community here in Greater Manchester, which has enriched both the Mancunian and the British culture over the years. Sadly, whilst the pandemic has put on hold my plans to visit Pakistan, I can confirm that Pakistan remains a high priority in this my second term as mayor and I look forward to visiting as soon as the time is right. So just following the kind message from the mayor, and I have to uh, be grateful to Maria Gonzalez from the Combined Local Authority who facilitated this um, on Andy's behalf. Uh, it's, it's a great pleasure for us to be working in partnership with the Federation. This is the first on a series of activities that we will be uh, delivering in the coming years. And we looked at through our partnership, we can help more Greater Manchester um, companies in Pakistan to do more trade and investment. So I wanted to also start to give you a brief introduction of the, the chamber uh, for those who might not be fully aware of who we are and what we do. So next slide, please. We are actually the largest chamber of commerce uh, in the UK out of 53. We have nearly 4,500 members across all sectors and sizes. We represent about 5% of all the businesses in the region and a combined workforce of 460,000 employees. Our key three sectors, and that's not to say that we do not have representation in other sectors, are manufacturing and engineering, property and construction, and business and financial services. We are an award-winning chamber that provides a wide range of business support services, ranging from skills to international trade and more. And we have a global business network that uh, expands through 40 plus partnerships. And we cover more than four, uh, 90 plus countries across the world where we help both UK and overseas uh, companies to do business and thrive both in the domestic and international markets. Next slide, please. In the last few years, we have been the recipients of a number of accolades, which we are very proud of. Um, but I'm not going to go into the detail right now. Uh, if you want to know more about what we do and all the number of projects that we are involved with, please do visit our website, uh, which is shown right there. These are some of the events that we have coming up, but you will have the chance to look at this in more detail when we send you the slides. Next slide and next slide, please. Now, I just wanted to give you a bit of an overview of the current trade flows between the UK, the Northwest, and more specifically with the Greater Manchester and Pakistan. I think this put into context where we are and where we could be in terms of trade and investment. Um, next slide, please. 
at the uh, as of 2020, uh, the total trade total 2,204 2, million, with uh, us having a negative trade balance with Pakistan, meaning obviously that we are importing more than we export to Pakistan, as you see in this slide. This is both combining both goods and services. If we have a look at the services, next slide, please. We can see that during the 2016 and 2018 period, we were registering growth year on year, um, but then we see a bit of a decline in 2019 and 2020. Similarly, in terms of our imports of services from Pakistan, we see year on year growth from 2016 to 2019 and a bit of decline and a, a contraction in 2020 as expected due to the impact of the pandemic. Next slide, please. In terms of what are the top sectors in which we are exporting and importing services, the top one is actually travel. In terms of uh, export, we do business services, intellectual property, government and financial services. On, a, on the import side, we're doing travel, transportation, business services, telecommunication, and intellectual property. That's a bit of a 2008 data, but I think it remains pretty relevant as of 2020. Next slide, please. Now, if we're looking into the trade and goods, again, we are saying that during the 2016-2019 period, both exports and imports grew. 70% and 15% respectively. As expected again in 2020, we saw a bit of a um, uh, decline and contraction. Uh, but um, I, I trust that um, in 2021, we're start seeing some recovery. As, a, as what are the key sectors in terms of exports? I put a bit of a comparison between 2019 and 2020. We can see that uh, the main export for the UK is within the crude materials, uh, money, uh, machinery and transport and chemicals. And this basically did not change that much during 2020. The only thing is that they, there was an increase in, the, in, in terms of the crude materials. When it comes to importing sectors from uh, Pakistan, actually manufacture related uh, goods uh, is what uh, takes the most predominant, uh, both in 2018 and 2020. Next slide, please. And now, what, how do we position ourselves within uh, other countries uh, in supplying goods to Pakistan? As of 2019, um, the UK was ranking 18th in terms of the supplying of goods. Uh, we were behind Germany, Netherlands, and Italy. And even though the, the UK has experienced some growth during the 2016-19 period, actually the Netherlands and Italy uh, show greatest, la the largest growth uh, within the European countries, both growing 116 and 89% respectively. Having said that, other markets also experienced some growth, uh, such as Qatar and South Africa, both growing significantly more than the European counterparts. I think this showcases that the UK as a whole uh, does offer and does have some room for um, growing uh, trade with Pakistan. Now, in this slide, we're looking at the regional contribution to the total UK exports to Pakistan. And I think this is important as well, because obviously in the Northwest, we are looking into how we can improve as a whole. We see that um, in the 2016-2020 period, actually London registered the largest growth in terms of the contribution to the total UK export, growing three percentage points. The Northwest contracted by 1%, Southeast 2%, and then we saw the largest drops in the Southwest and Wales by 6 and 4% respectively. We saw a, a bit of growth when unallocated during 2020, but I think that's mostly an impact from the pandemic where a lot of the logistics and transportation routes were kind of impacted. And many exporters were forced to send their goods from different ports um, during 2020. Now, next slide, please. We're looking into uh, the imports. And it's not surprising then that uh, following the message from the uh, mayor, 
we do have a great uh, diaspora of uh, Pakistan uh, people here in, in, in Greater Manchester. And in no surprise them to see that the Norwest is actually the largest region importing goods from Pakistan. And um, by currently in 2020, contributing to 34% of the total imports. And I experienced some growth dur during 2020 uh, compared to 2019, going 3 percentage points up. We also see the ease of England that went up by two percentage points. London went down by two percentage points and Scotland the same, but most of the regions remained the same during the, this period. Next slide, please. And this is just a, a, an overview how uh, we seen the growth during different periods. I thought it was important to say that most regions during the 2016, 2019, so right before the pandemic hit us, most regions were experiencing a great deal of uh, export growth to Pakistan, with a few exceptions, such as the Jokshan Humber and the Southwest. Um, and then obviously, as expected, in 2019, 2020, the pandemic hit us really hard, and this actually had an impact in the overall overlook of the 2016 and 2020 period. But if we can see actually London, managed to experience growth in both in all of the three uh, analysis period, 7%, 4%, and 2%. But as I said, we expect that this will start seeing some recovery in 2021. Next slide, please. And now having a look at Greater Manchester and Pakistan, uh, there are over nearly 1800, 1700 companies currently trading proactively from the Northwest to Pakistan, 675 exporting and uh, nearly at 1100 importing for Pakistan. Greater Manchester is, uh, accounts for more, for 41% of the total exporters and 58 of the total importers in the region. So it's without a shadow of a doubt that we can say that Greater Manchester is the leading trading partner for Pakistan and the Northwest region. We can see that during the 2016, no, back at the slide, please. In the last period, uh, during the 2016 and 19 period, we can see that Cheshire and Lanc Cheshire experienced the largest growth. Cumbria, Greater Manchester, Merseyside remain pretty much the same, and Lancashire registered some contraction. In terms of imports, we saw growth pretty much in all the subregions, with the exception of Cumbria, and I think Merseyside experienced some contraction as well. Next slide, please. So this leads us to uh, explore what is the UK export potential to Pakistan. Uh, pretty much there is a lot of uh, opportunities across many sectors. According to the International Trade Center, there is over 836.9 million US dollars worth of untapped and realized export potential for British companies. And the key sectors where there is a lot of room for uh, growth includes machinery, automotive, chemicals, pharmaceutical, and medical and optical devices. With uh, automotive having the most untapped potential of um, estimating 91%. Next slide, please. And in terms of services, again, a lot of opportunities within the education. And today we'll have um, one of our panels uh, will showcase some of those opportunities within this sector. So it's not just a professional development and training for teachers, it's about educational materials, e-coaching and web design, ITC, um, and so forth, security and defense from training, from expertise general and equipment and um, is, is, is areas where we have expertise and we could be doing a lot more. Healthcare from the design and building of new hospital, laboratory and clinical equipment, cancer treatment programs, kidney treatment program, good manufacturing practices. And of course, business and financial services, which is our largest export uh, sector across the whole UK. And within that, we also have the fintech sector, which is one of the fastest growing areas for the Greater Manchester region. So uh, I hope this has given you a taster of uh, all the opportunities that are out there for British companies and where we could be focusing more of our efforts 
to encourage more trade and investment. So now I would like to welcome, um, next slide please. Uh, our partners from the Department for International Trade, Arshat uh, Dadaboy, which is uh, one of the international trade advisors. And he will provide you with insights of how DIT is working with companies to help them realize their export potential. So Arshaf, if you can please uh, join us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Susanna. My name is Arshad Dadaboy. I'm an international trade advisor uh, for the Department for International Trade. Uh, it's a privilege here to be to present and uh, to, 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 to speak at, at, at your event, and I'm very grateful for that. We're very excited here at DIT about Pakistan. We hear lots of uh, stories and uh, news uh, around the development there, particularly at the, the new port in Gwadar, and also the, the, the highway that's been uh, now developed that, take, that, that helps the, the, the movement of uh, merchandise and all the new industrial parks that have, that have sprung up along that highway uh, from north to south. So it's an, it's an exciting time to be doing business with Pakistan. More importantly, my remit here is to, at DIT as a trade advisor, is to, is to help you uh, tap into that market. And we work very closely with the Chamber of Commerce, the embassy uh, in Karachi, uh, the post there in, in Pakistan, uh, to help you uh, gain some traction in those markets. Um, I've been only given five minutes. Uh, as a small window, there are many more exciting and more interesting speakers than I am today present. So in a nutshell, here's what we do. Um, uh, the first take home message I have for you all is to make a note of the great.gov website. Uh, that's a, a very useful uh, website for all of you to go and uh, to visit and to, to get information about particular markets. On that website, you will find um, country specific details uh, the, the, the nature of the economies out there, how to do business guides and, uh, and an overview of, uh, of buoyant sectors out there. That's quite an interesting uh, website and I urge you all to take a note of that. Um, there's also another uh, link in that website and that's called Export Opportunities and Business Profiles. Now here is a, uh, uh, there is an option here that you can upload and register your own company there and then you'll be able to upload a profile and, and photographs and your catalogs on there. And uh, anybody out in the, across the world who visits these websites have access uh, as a keyword search to look at uh, your products. Um, and also our uh, embassy partners and, and, and other chambers of commerce around the world, when they receive inquiries or tender opportunities, they upload them and, and the way it works, it will alert you by an email. Um, that a certain opportunity to come that, that matches your profile. So that's something that's very interesting. Looking at a more local level, there's a team of us about 30 here in the Northwest. Each of us has their own sort of uh, speciality and sector and country focus. I myself uh, have over 20 years of export in experience in industry, particularly in chemicals and plastics. Uh, and I now manage the Middle East, uh, also Pakistan. And I also focus on a defense and security sector. So we're, we're here. Okay, I'll carry on. Um, so we're here to visit customers uh, uh, at your convenience when it is safe to do so, although we haven't been visiting at the moment. But we're here to, to mentor you and to guide you. Uh, and we hold a number of workshops too. Uh, at the moment, we've got uh, a couple of uh, initiatives at the moment. We have a, uh, an export academy. So if you're new or a novice exporter or thinking about exporting, I'd, I'd encourage you to sign up to our export academy program. Uh, there are lots of online free workshops that you can go on and learn all about exporting in terms of documentation, market research, risk, uh, how to factor in the, the potential costs of exporting, anything to do with that. You know, the Export Academy is really good for you. We also have something called the Internationalization Fund. That's eight to nine thousand pounds of match funding. So if you're thinking of visiting or doing a trade show, or internationalizing your website or translating, for example, anything export re related, uh, we've got funds there available that you could uh, subject to an eligibility criteria you can apply for. Moving rapidly across, 
there's something called the Trade Show Access Program. Uh, that's an excellent uh, initiative by the DIT. Uh, we we book stand space, stand space at major trade shows around the world. Uh, so if you're a small company or a medium-sized company, very reluctant to go overseas or not sure how to exhibit, this is the way to do it. It's subsidized. You, you simply fill a form in, submit it to the trade body at the management fund, and you will get a, uh, a booth on the UK pavilion at one of the major trade shows in the world. We, 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 there's a whole list of them. Um, Medical, for example, is one. K in Germany is another one. China Plus is another. Um, uh, Itma for textiles, again, is another one. So all the major trade shows are covered there. We also have lots of uh, webinars and master classes running all the time. Uh, for you to register and attend um, or, or go online and, and look to. So these are things that we do and we continue to do. Um, we also have moved into the digital. We recognize digital is an explosive area. Um, so we have e specialist e-commerce advisors who talk about different platforms, how to op uh, help you optimize your websites and your search engine uh, sort of uh, rankings and, and also how to, to uh, sell online. That's my five minutes over. Susanna Cordoba has all my contact details. If you wish to uh, get in touch, please do so. And thank you again, uh, all of you for listening and for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Arshad. And now if I could welcome um, Arthur Sultan uh, to give a quick remark from the Federation of Pakistan Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> You're mute. Imram, you're mute. Uh, Susana, President of PCCI was called in for a meeting at President House, so he would not be joining in. So I suggest we move on to the next agenda item. Okay, thank you. So we now can welcome the Board of Investment of Pakistan uh, to provide a deeper overview of the wide range of investment opportunities in, in the country. So uh, if I can welcome Ms. Farina Mashar to do the presentation, please. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, Mr. Nasir Hayat Magu, I think he's not here. So Mr. Arif Ahmed Khan, Chairman TDAP, Mr. Imran Khalil Nasir, Chairman Pakistan UK Business Council, distinguished participants from Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce, ladies and gentlemen, assalamu alaikum and a very good morning. Uh, it's a good morning for you, but a good afternoon here in Pakistan. It is a matter of great pleasure for me to join all of you here today. I would like to thank the Federation of Pakistan Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Pakistan UK Business Council for organizing this event. I'm confident that with this conference, it will provide a robust platform to the participants to interact and explore new avenues for trade and investment opportunities. Being an economy of 220 million, 60% of which are below the age of 30 years, Pakistan offers investors a strong and large consumer market with an ever expanding middle class. The country's strategic location at the crossroads of South Asia, Central Asia, and West Asia, and close proximity to the Gulf countries makes Pakistan a promising regional hub and an important market for trade and investment. Currently, UK is the second largest investor in Pakistan after China, Pakistan has received a net FDI of 117.3 million US dollars during financial year 2020 in various sectors such as tobacco, chemical, petroleum, power, cement, pharmaceutical, and financial business. Various British companies such as Pakistan Tobacco Company, ICI Pakistan, Attic Refinery, Best West Cement, Shell Pakistan, Mizan Bank, HSBC Bank, and Standard Chartered have made substantial investments and have successfully been operating in Pakistan. I'm confident to say that there's a tremendous potential and scope in the economies of our two countries for further mutually beneficial cooperation. We need to diversify our exports and explore new avenues to enhance our economic and trade relations. 
business to business interaction and incentives to the private sectors are inescapable steps. We also need to motivate our businessmen to establish long term business relations. Pakistan offers a secure and safe environment to investors in all sectors of the economy. There are ample opportunities for British investors to invest with 100% equity or joint ventures in various fields. Repatriation of 100% investment and profit is allowed under the investment policy of the government of Pakistan. Let me also inform you about law of special economic zones, which has been formulated to meet the global challenges of competitiveness to attract foreign direct investment. The law allows creating industrial clusters with liberal incentives, infrastructure, investor facilitation services to enhance productivity and reduce cost of doing business for economic development and poverty reduction. I invite British companies to explore investment opportunities in the approved special economic zones. Pakistan has improved 39 positions in the last two years in the ease of doing business ranking by the World Bank. And this year also, we are very hopeful that we'll, we will experience a further jump. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to highlight the role of Board of Investment. We have been mandated to promote, encourage and facilitate both local and foreign investment. Board of Investment acts as an interface between international and local investors, public and private sector, and it also works for enabling business environment through policy and strategic interventions. In order to facilitate international investors in targeting areas of investment projects, Board of Investment has developed an online database of available projects with the federal and the provincial governments containing 130 projects worth US dollars 60 billion. The investors are able to access these projects through an online portal on the BOI's website. In the fast changing digital environment, value of access to current and updated information cannot be undermined. In order to provide investors fast and easy access to relevant information, Board of Investment has developed an interactive website which is regularly updated and can be viewed in eight international languages, English, Chinese, French, Arabic, Japanese, Russian, and Urdu. In line with the vision of the Prime Minister and to facilitate investors, all services being offered by the BOI have been digitized, such as work visa, permission to branch and liaison office, and the special economic zones. An incentive database has been developed where investors can see the complete set of incentives being offered to any specific center. British investors are urged to visit the Board of Investment website, which is user-friendly, interactive, and holds comprehensive and updated information for prospective investors. I assure you full support and facilitation from our office and wish you all the best for your future endeavors. Thank you so much. Many thanks for that. Uh, we appreciate the commitment as well and the support on this uh, event. So now if I could welcome Mr. Jamil Ahmed to provide um, the, the further presentation on, on the opportunities. Sure, if you can uh, put the slides on please. A very good morning to our friends um, in UK and a good afternoon um, in Pakistan. I am Jamil Qureshi. I'm looking after investment promotion um, at the Board of Investment. Next, please. So just a few words about um, Board of Investment. BOI was established with the responsibilities of uh, promotion of investment and facilitation of local and foreign um, investors. Uh, BOI basically assists companies and investors who intend to invest in Pakistan and facilitates the implementation of their projects. The wide range of services uh, provided by the BOI, you can see on the slide, include providing information on the opportunities of investment and facilitating companies uh, looking for joint ventures in Pakistan. Next, please. Just a few important things uh, to be highlighted. A company now can be registered in Pakistan online within 24 hours. Pakistan now offers uh, online e-visa facility 
for 174 countries. We have recently launched Pakistan single window company as a part of compliance with the trade facilitation agreement of the World Trade Organization. Pakistan offers special incentives for technology, clean energy, and social sector, which includes housing and construction. Pakistan government allows a borrowing facility from local as well as foreign banks. Next, please. So in terms of the investment regime, Pakistan offers a secure and safe environment to investors in all sectors of the economy. There are ample opportunities for foreign investors to invest with 100% equity or joint ventures in various fields. 100% equity is allowed in all sectors, except um, few um, mentioned on the slide. Repatriation of 100% investment and profits is allowed. Next, please. As our secretary, Ms. Faina Mazar highlighted, Pakistan has improved 39 positions in the ease of doing business ranking in the last two years and was placed at 108th position. And Pakistan has now been recognized as the top reformer in South Asia. Next, please. Just to highlight a um, few of the many reasons to invest in Pakistan, we are a market of over 200 million people uh, with excellent regional connectivity with China, uh, West and Central Asia. We have done extremely well, as I mentioned earlier, in the World Bank's Ease of Doing Business Index and offer favorable investment regulations. Next, please. So these are some of um, the priority sectors of Pakistan, and I'll go through a few of them in detail. Next, please. So in terms of agriculture sector, as you can see, um, we offer reduced rate of custom duties on import of capital goods, exemptions on um, income tax for the food processing and beverages sector, and concessional rate of custom duties on import of ingredients for preparation of value added um, products. Next, please. For dairy sector, um, Pakistan is the fourth largest producer of milk. However, uh, five to seven percent of the milk is processed with 20 percent annual demand growth. So there is a huge potential for setting up processing units for local consumption and exports. The opportunities in value-added projects include um, whole milk powder, uh, skim milk powder, condensed milk, ice cream, butter, cheese, yogurt, and other things. Next, please. Coming to livestock, Pakistan is also one of the biggest meat market with growing meat demand due to increasing population and growing export potential of meat. The opportunities include corporate farming, meat processing units, breed um, improvement, veterinary medicine, and more. Next, please. Moving to um, tourism sector, Pakistan um, is land where we have beautiful mountains and rivers. Uh, I'm sure some of you um, have visited Pakistan. But, um, deserts in Pakistan make up a large number, a large part of the country's um, geography. There are more than 100 peaks above 7,000 meters altitude in the northern area of Pakistan. Our CPAC route includes roads, rail links, passing through the renowned mountain peaks and glaciers. Next, please. Pakistan, um, with its slogan, it's beautiful, it's Pakistan, has managed to generate great interest from travelers across the globe. Just to highlight, um, the British Backpacker Society has ranked Pakistan as the um, world's top um, adventure travel destination um, in 2018, describing the country as one of the friendliest countries with amazing mountain scenery. So major cities of Karachi, Lahore, and Islamabad are the leading destinations um, for business travel. Um, there's a constant rise in um, 
uh, in terms of tourist to the northern areas of Pakistan, especially Sawat Valley, which is also known as Switzerland of Pakistan. So Pakistan is working hard to eradicate its negative image and promotes itself as emerging Pakistan, promoting tourist friendly, safe and hospitable environment. Next, please. Electrical vehicle policy. So in auto sector, Pakistan has recently launched um, electrical vehicle, electric vehicle policy for which the benefits are extended to both existing and new manufacturers in terms of um, uh, general sales tax, um, uh, EV parts can be imported at 1% custom duty for five years. Import of new EVs in CBU condition at concessionary rate of 50% duty. The duty-free import of plant and machinery. Approved investor can import 100 CBUs with 50% CD. Exemption from sales tax and VAT on import of CKD. Exemption from federal excise duty on electric vehicles. And we have a special window at State Bank of Pakistan for EV car financing at reduced rates. Next, please. Somebody on the chat asked for information technology. So here we are. So in terms of our IT sector, the exports have increased 70% during the last three years. There is zero income tax on IT and ITS exports and sales tax exemption on export of IT services. There is zero income tax for registered IT startups. We offer 100% foreign ownership of IT and ITS companies and income tax exemption on startups and export of IT solutions and services. I hope this answers the question of one of the friends who asked this question on our chat box. Next, please. So the IT exports were recorded at um, US dollars 1.1 billion for the financial year 2019-2020 and are expected to increase further in 2021. Internet penetration has increased from 2% to about 30% in the past four years with high demand in the international market. Pakistan was ranked at number four for the freelance IT development in the world, which is great news. Next, please. In terms of housing and construction sector, we offer exemption of withholding tax on purchase of building materials. We have granted construction sector the status of industry. There is new uh, fixed tax regime for, uh, from tax year 2020 onwards for eligible builders and developers. Next, please. We offer reduction in um, tax liability and exemption um, of capital gains tax for low cost housing under the prime minister's uh, housing scheme. A package of 100 billion has been, um, rupees 100 billion has been announced to build affordable houses. Banks have increased their credit for financing the houses, housing and construction sector. Out of total population, 36.4% resides in the urban areas. Next, please. As our secretary highlighted earlier, the law of special economic zones with lucrative incentives has been formalized. Um, the law allows creating industrial clusters with liberal incentives, infrastructure, investor uh, facilitation services to enhance uh, productivity and reduce cost of doing business for economic development and poverty reduction. Investors, uh, UK investors are encouraged to establish their facilities in the notified special economic zones and avail these lucrative uh, incentives. Next, please. I'm trying to be quick to finish my slides. I know I have a limited time. So uh, to decrease air pollution and carbon emissions, Pakistan is supporting clean sources of renewable energy generation. The famous uh, Gharo Jampir wind corridor in Sindh province has been identified as the most lucrative site for wind power plants. The wind power potential covers an area of 9,700 kilometers with gross uh, wind power potential of 43,000 megawatts. The coastal line of Sindh has sources of wind up to 20 gigawatt electric generation potential. So government of Pakistan will provide full facilitation to companies for the development of power projects through alternate energy development board. Next please. In terms of, um, this is the same, next please. 
So in terms of uh, pharma industry, Pakistan has a vibrant and forward looking pharma industry. Pakistan's uh, pharmaceutical and healthcare sectors are expanding and evolving rapidly. About half the population has no access to a modern um, um, medicine, which represents an opportunity for UK investors. Pakistan has about 760 pharmaceutical manufacturing units, including those operated by 25 multinationals present in Pakistan. The Pakistan pharmaceutical industry meets around 70% of the country's demand of finished products. Next, please. A couple of more slides. Um, th these are a total of 25, 22, sorry, apologies, 22 special economic zones in the country, having diverse mix with the four special economic zones under CPAC, 15 uh, public sector SECs, and two sole enterprise special economic zones. Next, please. And this slide just shows the geographical spread of our existing identified special economic zones. Next, please. Just to say, Pakistan is open for business. This is just a few uh, of man, many multinational uh, companies profitably operating in Pakistan. Next, please. I think we've already gone through this. This just slide shows FDI flows between Pakistan and UK. Next, please. So thank you very much for your attention. Our contact details are there um, on this slide. Kindly feel free to contact myself for any information. I'll also request you, as requested by the Secretary BUI, to visit our recently launched new interactive website, which has all the information, including 130 project, projects worth um, $60 billion. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Emil, for such a comprehensive uh, presentation about all the different opportunities and the different sectors. Uh, that's very much appreciated. Today, we also want to welcome the Trade Development Authority of Pakistan. I know Mr. Arif Ahmed is not available, but we'll have Riaz Sheikh um, have, uh, replacing him uh, on the presentation. So if I can welcome you to join us. Uh, Thank you very much, Madam. This is Riyaz Sheikh. I'm the Senior Most Director General here in TDAP. As you have said, uh, Chief Executive has to rush for some other work. So I apologize on his behalf. And I welcome you all, the Excellency, the distinguished guests, all the business community leaders from FPCCI, BOI, my colleagues there, to this uh, important seminar. We have a presentation made uh, covering both the aspects, you know, trade and investment, but uh, since uh, the investment being mandated to BOI, they have already covered it. So I'll skip those slides and uh, we'll mostly talk about the trade issues. Some products uh, potential there and particularly the GSP plus scheme after uh, what, is the, what is the status of it after the Brexit and where we are at this moment. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll move on that especially. Please uh, move on the slides. Yeah, the scheme is okay, yeah. Pakistan profile, everybody knows. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Investment slides, you can move on. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, previous one, please. Yeah. So, as you are uh, aware that uh, when the UK was part of the uh, EU, so we offered the GSP Plus scheme, which we are availing. It is available till December 2023. Most of the items of tariff lines covered in this scheme are zero rated. So after the Brexit, almost the same arrangement has been made. I, I remember uh, from British Trade uh, Department, Mr. Simon Field came here about a year ago when we, we have the initial days of COVID. So we had a discussion, try to disseminate this information and get the views of the trade. So we conducted uh, uh, seminars at four places. I think in Sialkot, Lahore, Faisalabad, and then Karachi with the help of chambers. Here in Karachi, we did it with the FPCCI. So just to try to, to disseminate that information, what would be the status of you know Pakistani products vis-a-vis -vis Brexit. So we what we got actually, I think at the deal at the end, it is almost similar. The system is also similar, but of course, you know, the database, the, the statement of origin system, which EU adopts is not there. So they are reverted back to form A. And I remember the cumulative uh, accumulation class is also there, so we can where the exporters can get advantage also. So this scheme is very much intact, and we are happy that we are availing that 90% of the you know products going to UK are already zero rated or tariff uh, zero tariff. 
So uh, in this context, I just want to say that the scheme is being continued, and I think the, at that time we were offered that enhanced, you know, the CSP plus scheme. Next slide, please. Yeah. So at this, as I mentioned earlier, that we are availing this, you know, the Pakistani exporters of products zero duty. They own ninety percent of the products in Pakistan has been made eligible, you know, along with some other countries as mentioned there to avail to have this facility till two thousand twenty three. So we are at this moment, you know, trying. We discuss MFN plus uh, things also. There may be some more products to be included in that. We are progressing towards that, and I hope that with the support of the uh, trade, you know, we can include more items. Or maybe try to get more advantage of this scheme. Next, please. Next. Next. Okay, bilateral trade figures have already been presented. I think in the in the presentation before, uh, you can see uh, that very clearly that the trade balance, you know, tilt is in favor of Pakistan. Uh, trade is to the tune of more than two, two point five, two point three billion dollar somewhere, but uh, uh, it is progressing. And the figures, I think, if we take the two thousand nineteen, it is okay almost, but a little bit down as far as the exports are concerned. Next, please. Yeah, a uh, product profile. If you see in the two digit, you know this uh, HS code, we find that most of the items, you know, are from the Madras textile garment group. So rice also there, uh, cereal uh, from the cereal side. And if you see the product profile uh, from the uh, UK, so we see that most of the high uh, end industry, you know, machinery equipment, these are the items which are coming from the UK. Next, please. Yeah, as I mentioned that. Okay, next. Okay, on six digit, if we take, try to see the potential. Please slide, please. Uh, heading is missing. No problem. It shows the potential actually. That I can manage. No problem. So, if a six digit, you know, HS code, we see that most of the items we go deep down in the textile or made up sector. We find that the linen, the t-shirts, you know, this pants. Uh, the garments and last item is the semi-milled rice. You know, as I mentioned earlier, basmati goes well and some area also. So we, if we look at the UK's import, you know, this from the world, and we see what we are exporting to them, we have a huge gap. You know, that that potential lies there in the similar items. I'm not talking about the new items there that can also be explored. Uh, for uh, but as as far as the existing items are concerned. There is a huge potential still lies, you know, that can be improved and can be cashed on. Yes, please. Next. So, if we talk about the product profile from Pakistan side, what we are exporting to the world, mostly to to uh, Far East or to uh, African countries, but to some European countries also. So, some of the items, you know, are highlighted here: uh, is the agricultural farm machinery implements. these are being exported as far as the standards are concerned let me tell you that in pakistan standard control authority and the standardization process has also been improved and most of the ce standard is followed to products which are being exported to see particularly the fan and all these uh, you know engineering light engineering items similarly the cap the cable so these are also of international standard next please Uh, football everybody is aware you are making for the for the fifa for the world cup you know this uh brusuka and then the telstar 18 all have been from pakistan so uk is also a football playing nation so there is a huge potential lies for this also similarly for the keeping in view the weather all that and the the garments which are required like the leather garments and other garments we are already uh, being outsourced you know from nike adidas zara and some other renowned you know brands from the from the world so th there lies huge potential in these products also next please mango is a seasonal item of course but it being started in the month of may now a lady started rather for export so we continue till august so be uh, more than 1.7 million you know diaspora pakistani diaspora being living there and other you know bengalis and the indian also origin people there so they like this mango so mango we normally do a lot this this year also we think that we can uh, do more exports as compared to last year 
IT uh, we uh, business outsourcing you know, or processing we have got from so many other international clients. Some some British companies are also you know outsourcing their uh, this IT work here. So we have the potential. We have the trained manpower. So IT export has already you know particularly after the this COVID thing this is, this has become a blessing in disguise you know for most of the industries the IT being one of the industry so it has gained a lot uh, I think it has a potential also and more and more we expect that uh, the UK uh, the companies UK houses there can outsource their work with the, and uh, be in contact with the, with the, with our IT companies in Pakistan next please. So coming uh, to, to the uh, trade side, you know, potential that absolutely there is no denying the fact that there is a huge potential lies between, you know, both sides, uh, 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 promotion of uh, trade or exports from Pakistan, exports from UK also, there can be certain other items. But as my colleague from the uh, investment side has mentioned already, that uh, processed food, you know, and uh, textile, these are some of the the trade, tradable, you know, these items which we are already exporting, where investment can come, and we, what we suggest is the export-led investment can be can be brought from UK, and then these the, the, the plants or uh, the machinery can come here, and then they can improve upon because the labor cost and all the cost of doing business is already quite low as compared to other you know countries in the area. So that uh, potential can be exploited, and. Uh, uh, other things, policies already mentioned by that, you know, no need to repeat it. From the trade point of view, we would assure that in TDAP, we have the outreach through our two trade commissioner, uh, trade councillors also. Uh, one uh, trade minister there in uh, London, the other Mr. Akhtar there is in Manchester, is that trade investment councillor. So both through them, you know, we can, we can leverage so many, you know, this uh, possibilities can be uh, with, the, with the British, uh, you know, uh, businessmen, with the British importers and anything, they are also available here in TDAP. We are also available to support and uh, guide if there is anything we can do. That's all from uh, our side. I just wanted to make this uh, uh, point from here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much again for such a comprehensive uh, presentation about the opportunities. Um, I think it outlines really well uh, all the potential that both uh, the UK and Pakistan have, and especially Greater Manchester businesses. So now I want to welcome Imran Nasser, who is going to be our chair for the upcoming panel. Uh, we have a great line of panelists, which I'll let him to introduce you to. So uh, Imran, if I can ask you to join us, please. And I will take this opportunity to thank all the organizations that have been uh, present here today to share uh, their knowledge, their expertise, the different ways in, the, in which you can support businesses, as well as the British Deputy High Commission, and the International Canterbury Christ Church University, Systems Limited, Miamet, and the Trade and Development Authority. Thank you so much all and obviously the Board of Investment for sharing all the, their knowledge and uh, opportunities. So Imran, if I can now bring you up. Uh, thank you, Shoshana. Can you confirm if I can be heard? Yes, you can. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank BY and TDAP for the wonderful insights they shared about opportunities in Pakistan, especially for British businesses and members of GMCC. On behalf of Pakistan UK Business Council of Federation of Pakistan Chambers of Commerce and Industry, the apex trade body of Pakistan, I welcome the panelists joining us for today's panel discussion. We are joined by Mike Nithaviankis, British Deputy High Commissioner in Karachi and Director of Trade for Pakistan. We are also joined by Professor Annie Liu, Dean of International Canterbury Christchurch University, and she would be representing the education sector and, and uh, sharing her thoughts specifically relating to the education side. Mujahid Ali joins us from MyMed Pharmaceuticals. He's representing healthcare sector, and he will be sharing his experience of uh, setting up 
uh, the partnership in Pakistan. We are also joined by Asaf Peer, CEO of Systems Limited. He will be highlighting opportunities relating to Pakistan's technology sector and how British businesses can collaborate with the Pakistani tech sector. I will be moderating this session and just some housekeeping rules before we start. Uh, you can share your questions through the chat uh, option and all the relevant agencies have given their email addresses. If there are any queries, we cannot take through uh, the panel discussion or if you feel they're not addressed through the panel discussion, please do take a note of those email addresses so that you, you can share those with us later on. Uh, we'll see how the session progresses, but we would also be uh, we, we would also like to take a couple of Q&As from the audience subject to uh, uh, how we progress through the panel discussion. Uh, we will specifically be sharing opportunities relating to three, three areas, education, healthcare, and technology, and also uh, asking people for their insights and sh to share their experiences. If I ask Mike, uh, if I can start off with you, firstly, thank you for joining us to this uh, panel discussion and today's session. If I can start off with you by asking you, how is UK's Department for International Trade encouraging and facilitating more UK businesses to enter Pakistan? Thank you very much for inviting me to the panel and congratulations to Greater Manchester Chamber of Commerce and FPCCI uh, for arranging today's webinar. Let me try and be brief since we are um, running short of time. So the Department for International Trade uh, team in Pakistan has representatives in Islamabad, Lahore, Karachi. We support the British companies, the 160 or 170 British companies that already have a uh, bricks and mortar or a representative presence in Pakistan um, through regular engagement. Obviously, during the COVID pandemic, we've not been able to have uh, much by way of face-to-face -face trade missions and in-person uh, activity through trade shows, but we're trying to do as much as we can in the virtual space and being as productive as possible. I think for the reasons set out by many of the speakers already about the scale of uh, Pakistan's uh, business sector, the, the young demographics, the connectivity with the UK, the diaspora uh, bonds that exist, the fact that um, uh, British Airways and Virgin Atlantic are now um, actively operating in Pakistan, the improved security environment, the opportunity for us to develop a, a closer trading relationship now that the UK has left the European Union. For all of these reasons, we feel that there is a lot of untapped potential in the trade and investment relationship and DIT is in the front line of trying to um, support more UK companies coming. I would just finish by saying that is the one area where we have much more to do. Those companies that already do business elsewhere in the South Asia region or in the Gulf, if they have not looked seriously at Pakistan, they now need to do so because the opportunities really are um, evident in the healthcare, education, renewables and infrastructure space. Uh, with a, perhaps security and defence being another. Those would be the ones that I would focus on. I'll pause there and happy to take questions um, and let others contribute. Thank you, Mike. I just want to bring in Professor Annie Liu. Uh, she is representing the education sector. She's Dean of International at Canterbury Christchurch University. Uh, Annie, do you want to share your experience and tell us a little bit about Canterbury Christchurch University's partnership uh, in Pakistan and also uh, how did you consider entry into Pakistan? Thank you very much. Um, thank you uh, for having me at this event and uh, share our uh, new and limited experience in Pakistan. I hope it's useful uh, to others. Uh, first of all, good morning and good afternoon to all. Um, as asked, um, I'll just do a brief introduction introduction of the university. So Canterbury Christ Church University is a public university located in southeast of England uh, in the county of Kent. Uh, it was founded in 1962 as a teacher training college 
and of course within the years has um, grown into a modern and uh, dynamic university uh, with the three faculties. We cover arts, humanities, education, medicine, health and social care, as well as uh, extending into science, engineering and social sciences. Um, the university has around 15,000 students um, based in and around the city of Canterbury, uh, studying on various levels from foundation to undergraduate and postgraduate degrees uh, up to PhDs. Um, it is the largest centre of higher education in the southeast of England for education and training uh, in the uh, many subjects associated with the public sector, uh, education, health and the policing, for its instance. Um, we are also uh, growing into the uh, STEM courses, uh, including engineering and medicine, etc. So the university is uh, actively working in partnerships around the world and our degrees are currently delivered in around eight countries um, and recently we are very pleased to have the new edition of a transnational education partnership with the City School uh, Limited uh, in uh, Pakistan. So this is a brief overview uh, of the university. Um, so why we are considering um, working in Pakistan? Um, I summarize two main reasons. Uh, first of all, we have in the UK have um, observed a high demand for UK degrees from Pakistan, but many students are disappointed, uh, unable to fulfill their pursuit due to either financial reasons or uh, visa uh, reasons. And of course, the pandemic recently uh, has made it worse. Um, and also it came to our attention that the Pakistani government um, has recently published its uh, TNE, Transnational Education Policy, and uh, officially opens its door to foreign education delivered in the country. So it is a timely opportunity uh, in our view to seek educational partnerships in Pakistan. And of course, this initial interest uh, has to be uh, supported by market intelligence, local knowledge, and the meaningful contacts. We were very grateful to our external consultant, as well as DIT uh, in Pakistan, who provided valuable advice and support in developing our first partnership in Pakistan. And secondly, I made my first visit to the country in November 2019, and there was a strong sense that both the public and the private sectors are enthused by the country's desire to reposition itself as a knowledge-based economy. A high quality education and teacher training in English language with international recognition are in strong demand. And this presents an excellent match with our academic strength and the past experience in other countries. Uh, for instance, our School of uh, Teacher Education uh, was um, commissioned by the World Bank to train over 4,000 teachers in Palestine and won the Times Higher um, Education International Impact Award. So with all the right conditions and uh, um, the local demand, we were able to identify a suitable partner, um, City School, as I mentioned earlier, to deliver our postgraduate certificate in education uh, in the three main cities. So um, these are the uh, main reasons why we are working in Pakistan. Um, of course, we, for those um, education sector who uh, are new to Pakistan and uh, probably considering uh, opportunities in Pakistan. Uh, if I may, um, I just would like to share a couple of recommendations from our current experience. Um, so this might not apply to all, but I hope it's useful um, to those who are looking into the country. So of course, um, needless to say, entering any new market requires a good understanding of the country's strategy and policies demand and market information and uh, conduct a thorough due diligence. Um, I would just like to highlight the two key factors I think helped us uh, to achieve where we are greatly. So we had a very helpful uh, external consultant uh, advisor 
who understands both UK and the Pakistan education sectors and are able to connect us with local businesses with good reputation, as well as governing authorities such as the HEC. And, um, um, and also certainly before I entered the country, um, we had certain uh, concerns of uh, um, uh, uh, local safety. Of course, uh, you know, to any stranger countries, you would have that feeling. So conducting in-country visits with local assistance um, helped us greatly to mitigate any uncertainties. And um, um, we also um, sought DIT's advice um, as well. Uh, so that was very advisable to anybody who uh, are looking into um, um, working in Pakistan. Uh, my first visit to the country was pleasant, safe and very productive which gave me the confidence of bringing the university to the country. And we've already started exploring other exciting opportunities in higher education and research uh, in Pakistan. And secondly, I, sorry, I, have I, I run out I, of time? Yes, Ani, I, I, I will come back to you. I just want to bring in Mr. Mujahid uh, from MyMed Pharma so that he can also tell us a little about uh, his company and also his entry into Pakistan. If okay. I can, if okay. I can give over to you and any good luck with your partnership with the city school, and we will be keeping in touch with you to uh, see how that goes. Uh, so, Mujahid Sahib, over to you for your uh, input on uh, MyMed Pharma. Sure, thank you very much, Mr. Imran, for allowing me to be part of this uh, panel. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks. Fantastic. Uh, I mean, MyMed Pharma, it's a specialty pharmaceutical company, uh, which I founded back in 2005 in the UK. Uh, we have a proven uh, track record over the last 16 years of supplying very novel and niche specialty products to the UK NHS and to various global markets. Uh, we've also been involved in various uh, uh, research and development programs for developing niche products. Okay, so one of the questions put forward to me was, uh, you know, what factors did we consider for entry into Pakistan? I think it's already been pointed out by some of the speakers previously. Um, obviously, being a pharmaceutical company um, and there being uh, a very low number of current facilities in place, we are in the process of setting up a biopharma research and development facility uh, within Pakistan, and we're looking to get this approved to a UK standard. Um, and this is looking at very niche products, which are currently not available in Pakistan, or they're imported at very high prices into Pakistan. So therefore not really providing an affordable option uh, to the local population. Uh, so one of the main attractions and considerations for us was uh, the special economic zone Okay, which is obviously part of the CPEC, where we're uh, currently in the process of setting up. Uh, this provides a world-class uh, industrial infrastructure, okay, at the fraction of the cost, as it would setting up in any other uh, international uh, arena. Okay, very low setup costs. Uh, there's zero import duties on things like equipment and machinery. Um, you know, there's no duty on raw material for production. And the added advantage of having 0% in sales. Okay, so these are the main considerations for us. Thank you, Mujahid. I want to bring in Asif Peer, who's representing technology sector. Asif, you want to tell a little about Systems Limited and also how can UK companies uh, establish their uh, partnerships or their setups uh, relating to IT in Pakistan. So if you can focus on that, please. Thanks. Thank you, Imran, and thank you, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, and good morning, good afternoon uh, uh, from wherever you are. So glad to be part of this group. Uh, uh, Systems Limited is one of the Pakistan largest uh, IT company. Uh, we are the largest software services exporter out of Pakistan. Uh, we recently been recognized by Forbes Asia uh, as Pakistan, uh, Forbes Asia has best 200 companies in Asia under a billion dollars. So we are we are listed company and we are providing services to North America, uh, Europe. Uh, we have office in Germany. We have office in UK. Uh, 
uh, and also in Middle East uh, and Pakistan here. So we have about uh, 3,500 people in Pakistan, uh, about 2,500 professional services, software developers, and uh, various skill sets that what we serve. Uh, and uh, Imran, to next question, uh, to answer your question, uh, it's, it's a great opportunity for anyone like Pakistan is uh, the destination where uh, we have the talent, we have the English speaking people, uh, we, we are working on the latest uh, technology stack. Uh, we have the BPO and call center facilities available, a uh, large infrastructure and a great talent to be part of that. So any company and even like our government is very, very supportive. Uh, BOI is present, TDAP is present. They all are very, very receptive from prime minister to uh, top down. Uh, that IT growth and IT export is the backbone right now uh, for Pakistan. It's essential. Uh, it's an essential industry now uh, for the growth, uh, as we have young population, English-speaking population, a lot of talent, a lot of skill set available, and uh, digital transformation and digital uh, world is uh, booming right now. So the demand is skyrocketing. Like we have been seeing. Uh, uh, our growth, I will share the numbers, but our growth of export has been increased from uh, since last year, about 44%, right? So uh, export of IT services is growing because people have more and more demand. And we are the two, two good advantage that what uh, any UK companies can outsource to Pakistan or can partner and collaborate with anyone. We have a very low turnover as compared to other countries in IT because... Uh, uh, we are we are in the developing phase, so about our turnover is uh, employee turnover is very low, but 10, 12 percent versus 25 percent in the neighboring countries. Uh, and also our price uh, technology is the similar skill set is similar what we have we offer, and we are very price competitive as compared to the neighboring countries. We are about 20 to 30 percent cheaper uh, because of the dollar parity and so on and so forth. So uh, we are well poised and. Uh, uh, with the government support and with the IT companies in Pakistan, we can definitely collaborate with anyone. And it's a great opportunity for the companies to reduce their cost and being efficiency through outsourcing into Pakistan. And we are looking forward to it. Thank you, Asif. I want to go to Mike to ask him about the latest entrance into Pakistan's market, uh, British Airways and Virgin Atlantic. Uh, how did that come about, Mike? If you want to share your thoughts on that, and then we can come back to Asif's presentation. Thanks, yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, I mean, obviously, we're very delighted that both those um, British airlines are operating in Pakistan. I mean, they came in, in at different times. Um, as you will know, British Airways uh, used to fly to Pakistan. I think they stopped in about 2008, 2009. They returned in June 2019, and in addition to um, initially flying into Islamabad, they've added Lahore. Um, there was a brief suspension, obviously, when COVID was bad and, and borders were under pressure. Um, and then Virgin Atlantic made a new entry into Pakistan last December 2020, which um, strikingly was their first and only new market during the COVID pandemic. I mean, I think they spotted an opportunity. We obviously know that PIA's flights to the UK, the European Union and elsewhere had been um, suspended. So I think they saw a commercial opportunity, but we've given both airlines quite a significant amount of support, not just on the um, challenges of operating during this COVID pandemic, but because they are such large um, identifiable British companies. And I hope, you know, now that they are both linked into um, Islamabad and Lahore. I hope it will only be a matter of time before one, perhaps both of them, will come to Karachi. Obviously, we don't have the diaspora links in Karachi that we the UK has in Punjab and Azad Kashmir, but um, let's hope that once we get over the worst of COVID, we um, see uh, both of those airlines um, redoubling their, their efforts in Pakistan, because we think for all of the reasons I mentioned earlier about the strength of the links between the two countries, we think there is a, a really strong uh, business opportunity for them to increase business travel, but tourism and family visits, uh, student visits in both directions. I have a question for Mike. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mike. Asif, can I ask you to share to to take us through your presentation and specifically share with us how UK companies can outsource to Pakistan and what sort of benefits would they get out of it? Could I request uh, a GMC to please put on Asif's presentation so that he can take us through his uh, slides? Thank you. Thank you. I can see that. Thank you very much for sharing. So next slide. I think tech, uh, we're saying that Pakistan is the next tech, tech destination. We are growing leaps and bounds as a country and providing the ecosystem. So I'll share like briefly for you guys, uh, Pakistan statistics. What are the areas of expertise? Because there's a myth people doesn't know uh, that there is all the technology stack that we can offer and do the work from here. We are working with the top notch fortune 500 companies, uh, and supporting already in Pakistan. And there is an infrastructure that is available and infrastructure services that what we have. So next slide. So uh, I think if you can keep just uh, doing the next until it the loads up, yeah. So <clears throat> in Pakistan export revenue is $1.23 billion to the world. And as I said, it increased uh, uh, 44%. By the end of June, we are expecting it will touch down to $2 billion roughly. We are exporting to un about 120 countries, uh, 10,000 plus companies, 500,000 IT professionals. Every year, uh, we do have 25,000 intake of fresh grads. And Pakistan, uh, I think, uh, is a third, Pakistan is the third in freelancing industry and ranked fourth in the world and is growing 47 per annum. Uh, we have about 1.5 million freelancers, right? That's what the, that's what the data we are getting. Uh, and uh, if you look at the right side, Pakistan is the most affordable country for IT outsourcing. That is the World Economic Forum uh, is saying. That's what I was highlighting in the start as well. This is Pak this is World Economic Forum's uh, input. Uh, we have uh, digital growth uh, is there in the Pakistan. Uh, is the third, lar third largest English speaking nation according to the world population review. So that's a great edge. Uh, we have the young population, about 60% of the population is under 30 years of age. Uh, very well defined uh, physical and broadband in infrastructure now. Uh, during the pandemic, it was stress tested because uh, we all have been working from home and we have been working from remote, remote locations and so on and so forth. So we were not closed for a single day during the pandemic uh, to serve our customers. I think uh, government of Pakistan, uh, we're thankful they have recognized IT industry as one of the essential industries. Uh, and due to that, we got a lot of uh, a lot of volume from around the world. We were we remained open and have zero days lapse in between. Uh, and uh, this has given the confidence to a lot of companies which were not outsourcing before. They wanted to create Pakistan as a disaster recovery or BCP center or alternate center. So all the if they are outsourcing to one country, they want to do to like certain percentage in Pakistan as well. And we were able to take it. And uh, all the IT companies uh, in the country has grown about 40% in the last uh, few months. I would say a few last, I would say six to nine months. That's where uh, pandemic, since the pandemic hit, we, we start from a digital, we all are using digital as we are connected. So digitally as well, it was not taught before. So, uh, so that's, that's what it is. Basically, I just wanted to share that Pakistan is open. Uh, for business, Pakistan, I think the law and order situation, the security situation, the physical infrastructure, the IT infrastructure, the network, the skill set, the most important in our business is the human resource, supply, skill set, the inventory uh, we have, and uh, we can provide services 24 by 7 to any company uh, in US and we can, uh, sorry, in UK and we can collaborate. As I said, a majority of the business that we do right now is with the United States of America, about 57% of our IT exports right now is with North America. And I think we would love to take this, uh, UK is about 18% or so, we would love to take the UK uh, to a higher percentage as well, because there is a potential and uh, we can collaborate. And as Mike mentioned that the airlines opened up to Pakistan, that is a great addition. Anyone can come in six hours, six to seven hours to Lahore and we can fly in and out and we can fly in and out our resources. And that's, a, I think that opening up 
I'm positive it will open up a lot of opportunities for services and export because people want to come and see the data infrastructure, how the companies are doing, what are the privacy laws, what are the cybersecurity laws, and we 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 have we have the certified companies. As I said we work with the top-notch Fortune 500 companies. So next, uh, thank you, As uh, thank you, Asif. Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Asif, if I can bring in uh, Mujahid here, uh, just just uh, we we'll, we'll be doing a detailed technology session with uh, in collaboration with GMCC as a follow up of this later on. So, if you have any last words to add, Asif, before I can move on to Mujahid Sir. Yes, I would like to just say to all the participants that uh, uh, please feel free to reach out to the council and we will be able to support you in any of your technology, business process, outsourcing, call center, infrastructure, cybersecurity, any of the needs that you guys have for to outsource in a cost effective way or you want to collaborate and open up your offices or want to collaborate with any local companies, any business model is available uh, uh, as BOI, TDAP, everyone is, everyone is present positive with the tune we have from the government and the direction we have all together from the companies and the government. We will definitely facilitate at the highest possible level. You will see that ease of doing business as much more improved and you will get the greater output uh, by investing or working along with Pakistani companies here. So we welcome you. Uh, all and looking forward to work with you and looking forward to spread the word. So my request is whoever has attended and from the Manchester Chamber, please uh, arrange B2B meetings, any networking meetings. We, I would love to uh, open up and share the ecosystem. So please uh, take some concrete actions out of this meeting and set up something and uh, bring Pakistani diasporas or Pakistani expats or UK companies into the mix and open up this export. This will be a great help to the country to increase our export and generate employment here in Pakistan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Asif. I just want to bring in Mujahid Sahib here. Mujahid, uh, any uh, learnings that you want to share with uh, members of GMCC who may be in a similar position considering entry into Pakistan? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I mean, Pakistan is a great place to set up business right now. Um, you know, with the advent of CPEC, uh, the potential for growth and return is huge, okay? Um, and it's a great opportunity to be able to bring in um, expertise from myself personally from the UK into Pakistan, okay? Um, and I would say, you know, go with an open mind. Um, if you are looking to set up and invest in Pakistan, go with an open mind. Obviously, being an overseas Pakistani and uh, born and bred from the UK, I understand the culture quite well. Uh, but there's a slight culture difference. So you need to go in with an open mind and setting everything up like in some of the previous uh, seminars, um, you know, some of the previous talks is very, very straightforward and easy. Um, you know, you can set up a company very easily online. You can set up bank accounts very easily. They've also got the Roshan digital account. So any foreign investment being repatriated back from the UK uh, into Pakistan is very straightforward and easy. Um, you know, I've seen a great change over the last, uh, I would say, five years uh, in systems and how the government's working in putting in very streamlined processes uh, to help businesses, especially overseas Pakistanis. Uh, so it's a great time. And what I would say is ensure any company looking to set up, ensure from the outset everything is legally tied up in black and white, uh, in writing, uh, make sure you've got all the relevant agreements and contracts in place and that you employ a good lawyer because you've got to make sure that everything is done, you know, uh, properly and in black and white. Uh, thank you, Mujahid. Uh, Professor Annie Lu, any last words from you? Thank you. I just wish to say that um, for the UK, um, education export is one of the largest um, uh, service export products. Um, and recently, the UK government issued the international education strategy. 
uh, with the ambition of achieving 35 billion pounds by 2030. And uh, I am um, a believer that Pakistan can play a very uh, valuable role in contributing to that realization of the ambition. Thank you. Thank you, Rani. Uh, Mike, if I can ask you for your last words and your advice for sharing with British businesses who are considering entry into Pakistan. Thank you. So I think just a few suggestions. I mean, in this day and age where we are not running in-person trade missions, there's quite a lot that we can, can be done virtually in terms of accessing people in Pakistan. They, they are incredibly accessible and hospitable. So even on a Zoom call or a Teams meeting, we can um, facilitate that. There will be some virtual trade missions that we will be running Greater Manchester as a region is one high priority region that we are already engaged in with some more diaspora outreach. The recently re-elected mayor of uh, Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham, whom I met a year ago or so, is very keen to bring a trade mission to Pakistan. We will reschedule that as soon as conditions allow. So companies in that uh, regional area, I hope you would be interested in signing up for that. And you can do a lot to prepare yourself for this market. I think if you are a British company that is not currently exporting um, beyond the uh, near proximate neighbours, Pakistan may not be the, the obvious next place, but if you're exporting in several other markets, the risk appetite, this, this uh, market really pays to, to, to show your commitment. And um, we can certainly support you in that and give you advice as, as to whether it is just exporting your goods and services directly from the UK, finding a distributor, looking for a joint venture partner, uh, bidding for a tender in the public sector, or looking at PPPs. There's a whole range of opportunities that I think DIT Pakistan, through trade advisors in the UK, would be keen to support you on. So don't be shy, get in touch with us. Thank you very much indeed again for inviting us to participate. Thank you, Mike. I'll thank all presenters, panelists, and support partners for their insightful awareness session aimed for British businesses to explore opportunities uh, with Pakistan. Our support part partners, I just want to name them and also uh, take maybe a last word from Pakistan High Commission officials who are also online with us. Uh, GMCC uh, for organizing the session, Board of Investment, TDAP, uh, Mike, your office, Gufran and his team, DIT team in Pakistan, uh, Mohammad Akhtar Saab, uh, Trade and Investment Secretary, uh, Council General of Pakistan in Manchester, Pakistan High Commission UK, Mr. Shafiq Shahzad. Uh, and any last, uh, I, if, if I can also have maybe a comment from you, but uh, if you're also online, just before we close off. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Imran. Uh, for a very wonderful uh, webinar, uh, very enlightening discussion we had, uh, especially from Mike and uh, Dr. Annie and other speakers. Uh, just last one word regarding education. We have seen potential for export of education from UK to Pakistan. Uh, I don't see any campuses of uh, you know uh, UK-based good universities in Pakistan. We understand that they have established their campuses in many of the countries. Uh, uh, I think we need to explore the possibility, especially given the COVID and the travel restrictions. Uh, maybe we need to work on that uh, for openings, uh, for finding such opportunities whereby uh, the top line universities can find some, uh, you know, campuses in Pakistan as well. That's one area. Uh, the other one, uh, my request to Mike, uh, that uh, we have seen that exports are growing, but still, uh, as we have seen from the UK side, export baskets is quite limited. So we need to find ways of, you know, expanding our trade and investment opportunities. Uh, we understand that UK has potential in export of services. We are good at export of goods. So maybe we need to explore some possibility for an institutional arrangement like free trade agreement between the two countries, whereby we can facilitate each other further and go into kind of a sustainable uh, institutional linkages between the two countries, which can go down the lane and uh, you know, give uh, a ground for the companies to work freely from both countries. 
So that's just my submission. And uh, thanks again, FPCCI, for holding this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Shafiq Sab. Just to name some of the organizations also who, whose representatives were also on the call. SME Center of Excellence, Amar Mirza, uh, Park Britain Business Council, UK PCCI, and other trade bodies from UK, uh, Jumpstart Pakistan, uh, represented by Amjad Pervez, and various other businesses who have joined us from, from the UK. Uh, I also want to thank directors and members of Pakistan UK Business Council, the staff at FPCCI and GMCC, uh, I understand we were not able to take all the questions from 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 our audience. Uh, it was a very short session, but please do make a note of the email addresses shared. We will be happy to facilitate you and connect you with the relevant authorities and answer any questions. We do hope to bring you further partnership uh, webinars along with GMCC so that we can share other opportunities. Over to you, Susana. Thank you so much, Imran, and uh, I'm not going to repeat myself, but I, I will just echo everything that Imran just said, and thank you to all the speakers, the panel, to you delegates for uh, sticking with us uh, through the webinar and sending us all the questions, everything just feels to a, a very useful conversation.